welcome back for episode 16 of the Yarn Curator podcast. My name is Naomi. This is my channel where I like to talk about knitting, spinning, fiber, um, and generally all things crafty. If you're new to my channel and this is your first time watching, welcome. I hope you like what you find. If you're a returning viewer, welcome back. I, I love checking in with you guys about every other week and having conversations either down in the comment section below or on Instagram. So thank you for coming back. If you would like to follow me on social media, I am the Yarn Curator on Instagram, and then I am House of Cardigans on Ravelry. If you'd like to be friends over there, uh, check those out. <laughs> so briefly at the top of the episode, you guys, I just wanna say a few words about the coronavirus and the global pandemic we're currently experiencing. First and foremost, I hope everyone is staying safe. If you're able to stay inside or at home around your own apartment or home or condo, I hope you're taking the proper safety precautions. Uh, really, it's a collective effort, not just within the US where I live, but globally. Um, and I hope everyone is being smart, safe and um, sanitized. So I know for one, it's already greatly impacted me and my personal life. Um, as many of you know, I work in a local history museum where my institution is currently closed to the public. I am fortunate enough that my employer is also through the local government. I'm a county worker. And so we have been given permission to telecommute, which is awesome. That being said, as a public servant, I have also been activated into my emergency disaster response assignment. Primarily, these are where I live in Florida, geared towards hurricanes. And typically, I do damage assessment at, at my museum. Um, if it ever got to be like a catastrophic level hurricane, then I would switch to working in what are called uh, county staging areas. And usually that's where you package supplies to go out to distribution sites. Well, <laughs> uh, with this, I have actually been activated into my primary assignment. So I have been working at one of these staging areas over the weekend. Um, and essentially what we're doing in Florida is the governor has requested that as they receive supplies from this national stockpile of PPE, it then gets distributed to uh, the county level where we then inventory it and then uh, send it out to hospitals, assisted living facilities, um, EMS, all of those essential services during this time. I don't normally do this in my episodes, but I did just want to read an email that I got from one of the professional organizations I belong to, and I think it has such a good message and it's worth putting out there at this time. So full disclosure, this is not my words or my writings. Um, it is by the chair of the Collection Stewardship Committee of the American Alliance of Museums but I feel as if they are pertinent at this time. And I'm gonna skip some of the initial stuff and I'll leave out some of the museum specific things, but I think the message is important. We are dealing with very difficult times, very trying times with the coronavirus affecting our daily lives and work situations. Many of us are no longer working from our office and we are not sure when we will return. We can only deal with what we have and make do with the current situation. We want to be here for all of you as we work through this. We want to provide whatever assistance we can, use the tools provided to us, and make the best of this situation. As we have learned over the years, our greatest tool is this community. The level and depths to which we will go to help each other is amazing. If nothing else, we can all connect and ensure that no one is alone. If any of us have a question, the listserv, in this instance, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, is a tremendous resource. 
I encourage all of us to continue using these resources to connect, to ask questions, to share your experiences. Please use these resources in a manner that benefits you. And benefits, in this case, the museum field, I would say the knitting community. Staying connected is of vital importance as we quarantine ourselves more and more. In order to foster connections, you can schedule regular Zoom meetings that we can use as question and answer sections, or just as a means to connect with your colleagues and friends. The social aspect of our community is so enriching. We don't want to lose that. As we work on this, we will pass along information. Do you feel as if you were not properly prepared for this situation? You are not alone. The pandemic caught many of us off guard, while many museums do have, once again, in this reference, you can substitute it for hospital, local organizations, etc. While many museums do have emergency or disaster preparedness plans in place, I don't think many of us were prepared for what has transpired. Now having this experience, now is the time to assess how this has affected us and what lessons we can learn. And turn those lessons into the next iteration of our own personal preparedness plans. If you did not have a contingency plan or continuity of operations plan, think about what you need now and see how you can plan for future emergencies. Can you work remotely? I realize we are all dealing with so much unknown. It can be scary. It is weird. We need to stop, take a breath, and deal with what we have in front of us at the moment. This is an opportunity to make future plans, to catch up with work, work on projects that we might not have had time to work on for a long time. Is there something in your house that needs doing? Spring cleaning, etc. That was me talking. Normalcy will return eventually. What projects can you start planning and preparing for? I am proud of all of you and I am grateful to this community and all of you within it. It is vital that we continue to push forward and stay together as a community. Please remember to connect with your colleagues and friends. If you have questions, use this space. If there's one thing I have learned over the years involved in this field is that we love to help each other out. And I would echo that for the knitting community. We want to be here for each other. Let's use it. If anyone has questions, suggestions, concerns, or just wants to say hi, please, please reach out and share your thoughts. I am here to assist however I can. Thank you everyone for what you do. Thank you everyone for being you. So as I said and paused at points throughout to apply that here to knitting and the fiber arts community, I just wanna echo those sentiments. If you have any questions, wanna chat, reach out to me on YouTube, on Instagram, on Ravelry. I am happy to connect with you at this time. I know I've already had some lovely conversations with some of my regular subscribers here on this channel over on Instagram. As I said, it's important that we all still feel connected to one another right now. I know that's not normally how I go about things on this channel, but I thought it was such an important message to share. So stay home, you guys, because it's going to get worse before it gets better. I'm not trying to be alarmist. I just want to try and use my platform to help reinforce and spread the message of, I won't call it social distancing, physical distancing. You can still be social with people. We live in a beautiful day and age of technology and social media. There's no reason you still can't connect with friends and family, albeit it might be through your phone or your computer, but it is what it is. At least we can still connect and communicate with people even if we can't physically be in the same room as them. So I think that's a small blessing. So as you guys know, in my last episode, I talked about an upcoming trip to North Carolina for the Carolina Fiber Festival. 
It was a trip that my mom largely organized for us where we were gonna get together over the course of a weekend. Uh, her, my sister, and my aunts who all knit. So yeah, we did end up getting together last week, last Thursday, two weeks ago now. Time has ceased to exist. So we got together two weeks ago and it was just before kind of the world turned over on itself. And in hindsight, we probably should have canceled our weekend altogether and all stayed home. But you know, hindsight's 2020. If you watched my sister Zoe's pod, most recent podcast episode, she has the Felicity Yarn Studio channel. She also did a little rundown through the weekend. So I don't want to duplicate too much what Zoe's already put out there. But yeah, we got together Thursday. We had a little all day dye session together where we all did our own custom uh, skeins that we, you know, said, hey, we're thinking in the blues, purples, beige taupe palette. And Zoe walked us through the dye process. And so that was a lot of fun. And that was Thursday and we said, oh, well, we knew there were two yarn shops just in the very immediate vicinity of where we were staying. And so we went to, the first place was called Great Yarns. It's in Raleigh, North Carolina, and did a little pre-festival shopping because at this point the festival was still on. And I picked up two skeins. Sorry, I'm going to start with acquisitions and this is gonna this episode is gonna be turned on its head as well um so i bought two skeins of this yarn from the fiber company it is their cumbria base uh, unto the hills it's a a blend of masham merino and mohair and it's this really pretty deep uh kind of teal blue black I've been into these really kind of, and kind of with this as well, these deep jewel tones blended with a little bit of black or blue, greens. I bought this in mind of making the Cuvia sweater by Caitlin Hunter. I think this is gonna be the contrast color for the color work on that. They had a really pretty cream colored there, but they only had one skein of it. Otherwise I would have bought the full sweaters quantity. The good news is the Fiber Co. is a large brand and I can order the main color online. So this colorway is called Black Beak and as I said it's 100 grams, 216 meters, and 236 yards per, per, per skein. In addition to kind of being into different colors and as you can see in the background my kind of usual palette which is neutrals and pastels with pops of color. I've really, like I said, been into these different colors. I've also been into yarns that are more textural uh, lately. I'm happy to add to my stash because right now it is a lot of indie dyed yarns um, and I'm happy to be building just kind of another option when I want to go shop my stash for a project. So I picked up that yarn there and then we headed over to another local yarn store called Warm and Fuzzy. They're located in the downtown portion of Cary uh, and they're an absolutely lovely yarn shop. I've been there a few times in the past and uh, both of these stores, Great Yarns and Warm and Fuzzy, both have really strong online presences. So if you want to go check those out, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Businesses are hurting, and if you have the financial means to support a local yarn shop, whether it be one near you or afar, I think that's a great thing for all of us to practice. So we went back to our flat that night, and um, we're just hanging out. We had a dinner with my brother, who had some exciting news, which I'll share in a little bit when we get to whips. And... Um, I was just scrolling Facebook on my phone because it was that day when it was like uh, Major League Baseball cancels rest of season, NBA cancels rest of season, Formula One postpones races, and you know, that was the day that everything started to close. And so, you know, I've been keeping an eye. I'm away from home. I'm away from work. I'm checking my email constantly, like what the heck is going on? And about 11 o'clock that night, we saw on Facebook, the festival had been canceled. 
So what do you do when five knitters are all together and in a city with a lot of yarn shops, you organize an impromptu yarn crawl? That being said, now knowing what we know, I definitely admit probably not the best idea. However, we did practice really good hand hygiene everywhere we went. We, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword because we did support local businesses and it's probably the last you know, in-person shopping a lot of these stores in that area are probably going to have for a while. So on Friday, we hit three different stores, the first of which was the Carry Quilt Shop. I personally didn't purchase anything in there. I kind of have the same sentiments that Zoe mentioned, which is I have a small stash of fabric here at home that I am probably not going to work my way through anytime soon. So I did not purchase anything there for that reason. That being said, if you're a quilter like my mother-in-law, she probably would have loved this shop. They had a lot of modern quilt samples on display, a really good variety of fabrics, and the store was really bright and airy, um, and I thought it was really nice. So next we drove to Apex, North Carolina. We visited a store called Downtown Knits. Um, I, before the festival, I had looked at a few different local yarn stores websites and this one caught my eye primarily because they had nightshades and if you watched Zoe's episode, you'll know she bought a sweaters quantity, we're twinsies and a lot. So I also bought a, a sweaters quantity of nightshades, it is by Harrisville Designs. And this is, it is American Cormo is the fiber content. The sheep are bred and raised in Montana. And then the yarn itself is milled and spun in New Hampshire. So if you are familiar with like Christy Glass's channel or some of the other bigger vloggers who go to Rhinebeck up in New York, um, that's kind of when they first released this yarn. And I've I've wanted to experience it since watching those videos a few years ago. So the way this yarn is milled is they mix black undyed uh, Cormo fleece with, then they also dye in the fleece um, other colors and then they blend those together. So it's this really subtle effect in the yarn. I picked up the talk radio color, which is uh, the color is this deep purple undertone. So it looks black from a distance, but when you're standing up close, it's closer to like a deep dark purple, kind of like, uh, you know, some people whose hair is so jet black, it almost looks purple. It's kind of that similar effect. So I bought five skeins of this. I haven't picked out a pattern yet. However, I don't know, a year ago, I was like, I'm not gonna wear any more commercially made sweaters. I'm a knitter, I can make my own stuff. And so I got rid of the staple black cardigan in my wardrobe, and then I have yet to knit a black cardigan to replace it. And there have been many times recently that I've wanted to go to work and just throw on a, a basic black cardigan and so I will be turning these into that um, is the plan and yeah otherwise I have to say they had a really cute store then later that afternoon we hit a place called the Hillsboro yarn shop as you can imagine in Hillsboro North Carolina super cute downtown area as well um, kind of a small store but with all huge selection. So I used a lot of self-control and only bought one thing in this store, which is an Acreworks gauge swatch. So it's a 3D printed four by four square. And then as you can see, there's uh, an X cross section in there that is negative space, I guess you would call that. That is not solid. <laughs> And so that is really great for measuring your row and 
in stitch count on your swatch. So I've already used this. It's proven to be useful. It was about $17, which is, in my opinion, a lot for a tool. However, I know it will pay for itself in the long run. I, um, to my aunt's demise, am preach the virtues consistently of gauge swatching and one day they'll listen to me. They won't. <laughs> yeah, that store also had a brand called Sincere Sheep who had a lot of kind of more rare breeds. She had a Cormo, another Cormo base, Rambouillet, and a few other blends that I was really tempted to make a purchase of. But at this point, I had just spent a good considerable amount of money on my sweaters quantity, and we still had four or five stores to visit. And so I wasn't ready to buy another sweaters quantity. Because of that, now I've started following the indie dyer and producer behind the yarns for that brand, Sincere Sheep. So I'm gonna look out for a shop update from her when I can purchase that yarn directly from her. She also dyes fiber, so I would be curious into trying some of the fiber to spin that she sells as well. That's part of wanting to just purchase from her directly. So finally, the last store called The Twisted Knitter. It's in Mebane, North Carolina. So her store was probably the furthest from the city center in Raleigh, Cary, kind of that area, you definitely got a little more taste of the country out there. And uh, the store owner was really nice. I think she was really happy to see people in the store amidst the initial, you know, calls for physical and social distancing. And I personally did not purchase anything in there. Like I said, with the Acre Works bobbins, I was comfortable within my budget at that point and not really anticipating spending that much more money. So that was the end of Friday for us. Uh, Saturday, we had a couple more stores that we were interested in hitting. So we went to Freeman's Creative in Durham, North Carolina. This was probably my personal favorite store that we hit out of the whole trip really reminded me of Fancy Tiger out in Denver, Colorado. It was just a fun store. It had a fun vibe to it. Um, and they had a mix of yarns, embroidery, sewing. They actually had a little maker space in the back of the store with sewing machines. I'm not sure if they do like drop-in classes or you can go rent a machine when you're there. I should have asked, but um, there were several people working on sewing machines and kind of chatting and helping each other out. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, I've never seen anything quite like that in other yarn stores that I've visited. So at first I just had this bar of wool soap by Twig and Horn. It's unscented. So we were walking around the store and looking and then I spotted a skein of Fully Spun. And her business is similar to, um, why do I always forget their name? Her yarn is similar to Spin Cycle in that she dyes the roving and then has it, unlike Spin Cycle, she has hers milled. She doesn't own her own mill. However, it's a little more affordable in the grand scheme of things than Spin Cycle yarn. Her price point is about the same as Spin Cycle, which is $35 a skein. So this is definitely a treat yourself yarn. However, you get 100 grams, unlike the Spin Cycle, which is sold in 50 gram balls. So if you like that kind of marled, self-striping effect, I would definitely look at Fully Spun. So I picked up one skein of this. It was the only one left in the store, and it is in the Spray the Champagne colorway. It's this really pretty peachy, orangey coral with a navy and then there's a little bit of gray and pinks and kind of an undyed white color. So I've had my eye on her for a while. I also follow her on Instagram for shop updates which do sell out quickly but if you are like me and we're just waiting for the perfect moment 
I had kind of grabbed it off the shelf and it's a good thing I did because my Aunt Mary told me if I didn't have it in my hand, it would be in her hands. <laughs> so anyways, now I'm standing in line. I have wool soap, I have a ball of yarn, and I noticed by the cash register she had all of her pins. So I picked up this baller pin, which is super cute and is going to go with all my other pins. And then I also saw these Katrinkles buttons um, and this one says, thanks, I made this, which I thought was, I thought these were super cute. So I grabbed a second one of these for Zoe and I's giveaway um, or for the make along that we're hosting. This is going to go in one of the giveaway packages. So yeah, that was it for the damage I did over the course of the weekend. I do have a few other things to show you that were not purchased, but were the result of our dye efforts. I do have to say, one of the things I noticed um, from a lot of these stores that we visited, they all kind of carried the same thing, which I thought was really interesting. Most of them carried uh, a brand called BC Garn, which uh, reminded me a little bit of Bishas and Bishu in that it's, I believe they're also a Scottish brand or UK based at least and have a mixture of woolen and worsted spun yarns at an affordable price point somewhere in the 10 to $15 uh, range for like a really nice sturdy merino. Uh, to me it's a little bit nicer than like your Barocos but not as luxurious as, you know, an indie dyed skein, but really pretty range of colors, really soft. Some of them had a nice high twist to them. Some of them were more wool and spun. So yeah, I would definitely say if you're curious, check them out. A lot of them also carried the fiber company as well as a new, new to me, I think, a uh, manufacturer called Ilamani Yarn Co. and they had a variety of bases that I think are great for people like me who live in the southeast. A lot of blends with linen, cotton, they had some interesting alpaca cotton blends if I'm remembering correctly. Or, you know and then they the rest had their usual yarn store staples that you're used to seeing like Barocco, um, like the uh, sock yarn Zoe picked up. But I can't think of the other brand right now and it's similar to Opal. I will google it and put it down below because it's going to drive me crazy that I can't remember it and give it like 20 minutes and I'm just going to yell like it's whatever company. Schattenmeyer I think might be it. Regia. Something along there. I'm getting closer. I took some film footage of most of the shops while we were there. I'm going to put that at the very end of the episode. So if you're interested in, you know, virtually touring these stores, check that out at the end of the episode. Anyways, that is the rundown of our weekend. And I've debated splitting this episode into one, but you know what, you guys just buckle up. It's going to be a long one. So we'll move into normal podcasting content, which is finished objects and whips and all of that good stuff. I do have a couple finished objects as well as a couple whips to show you guys. So first and foremost, we will address the sweater in the room, which is my finished Isclad by Caitlin Hunter. I will stand up so you can see it. So this is knit out of Holst Super Soft Held Double in the Mariner's colorway and I also held it with a strand of Lang mohair um, and I'll hold that mohair up in a second. So this is I would say a pretty beginner friendly epi episode sweater. It's a oversized raglan. It features this lovely cable detail along the raglan and I chose to carry the cable down the side. I don't know if you can see that as well. So that's one of the modifications I made. And yeah, it's really big, really cozy. I do have to say the holst is a little bit on the itchy side. It's one of those sweaters where 
you notice the itch and then if you wear it for a while, you kind of forget about the itch. I don't know if anyone else experiences that. However, if you do have sensitive skin, maybe you're sensitive to like eczema issues, might not be the yarn for you. However, it did really soften up and bloom after I blocked it. So Holst is a, partly why Holst is so affordable is because it comes to you with the spinning oil and grease still in the yarn. So you do have to kind of be careful when you're blocking it because you don't want to felt it. It's not a super wash yarn. You have to slightly agitate it to get that spinning oil and grease out. So when I blocked this, I did use my power scour on it. It's what I use to get lanolin out of fleeces when I wash them. So I thought that would be an appropriate use on this particular sweater. I did do it in lukewarm water because as you know, heat plus agitation equals felt. So yeah, I did it in lukewarm water. It just meant I had to wash it, you know, closer to five or six times. And then I laid it out to dry. I did do some modifications to this. I do want to do a finished object video for this. So I'll talk about them briefly here. I added in some waist shaping. The way this pattern is written is it actually tapers down and I did not think that would be flattering on my particular figure. So I added in some waist shaping. So I decreased and then added back in to create more of a curved hourglass shape. As I said, I chose to carry the cable detail down the sides of the sweater. I added in rows in between the cable repeat. I thought they felt kind of short and squat, so I chose to lengthen out the cable on the side over here. And I wish I, in hindsight, I wish I would have done that along the raglan. I don't know if you can see, here is the raglan cable, and then here is the you can just see it's just a little longer and a little more elongated. I also chose not to make the raglan as deep um, in the sweater. It's kind of more of a batwing dolman style where you divide for the sleeves closer to down like here, which was like Caitlin Hunter's thing, I think a couple years ago. I personally did not want that much room, so I just knit to what I normally do for a raglan, which is about 11 inches or so along this seam. I've gotten to the point where I've knit enough sweaters now where there's some things I can just measure, stop, and alter as I go, which feels really good to have progressed that much within my own personal knitting knowledge. However, yeah, the pattern does stop or the divide for the sleeves happens more down here. That being said, I kind of winged it on the sleeves and just chose to do a nice drapey uh, sleeve on those. So I don't know if you guys can see. So yeah, overall, I'm really, really pleased with this finished project. I think it's gonna be great as like something to just throw on and go and almost wear it like a coat here because I don't really have a need for a coat living in Florida. So yeah, that is finished object number one. I did finish my tiger owl cowl. This is a pattern by Greg Cahoon and it is a free pattern online. It was the craft along project for the Carolina Fiber Festival. They did one knitting and one crochet pattern that you could choose to make in conjunction and wear to the festival. So I knit mine out of some La Bien Me in the pink granite colorway. Zoe picked this up for me, thank you Zoe, at Black Mountain Yarn Shop, which is located in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm probably, I am, I'm holding up the side that has my, I like to say he's my owl with like a broken blood vessel. His one eye is just a little bit, it's a bit large compared to the rest. So anyways, it's this beautiful lace stitch pattern detail, which makes kind of an owl face motif. And then each of those motifs are broken up by a cable repeat. And yeah, I finished this 
Wednesday night at the Airbnb. I had one repeat to go when I got on my plane to Charlotte and I had just about finished all but about four rows of the repeat. So I finished those in the car uh, with Zoe and I finished those right as the sun was going down as we drove from Charlotte to Raleigh. And then I did the ribbing at our Airbnb and I chose to do a sewn bind off for this. It's something, I believe it's sometimes called a half Kitchener. I saw it on a Facebook group and thought, oh, I'll give it a shot and try it out. It's supposed to flare a little less than the lace bind off, but still give you a nice stretchy bind off. I did actually do it on the sleeves on this as well. Um, so, but yeah, you can see nice and stretchy, not super flary. So there it is. And last but not least, um, in the world of super exciting finished objects, I have made two dishcloths. So this is just some basic sugars and cream. So I just wanted to make some basic washcloths for us. I didn't follow a pattern. Uh, this is the first one I made and I cast on three stitches, added in a yarn over and knit across and then just did a straight knit row. So increasing on the diagonal. I just did that till I thought it was wide enough and then finagled some decreases within there as well while maintaining the yarn over. It's not perfect, but it's a washcloth. And then this one I just cast on, I think 25 or 30 stitches and just knit and plain garter stitch back and forth. And then I did a, an I cord when I got to the end. Um, and what I'm gonna do is sew that down like that um, so I can hook it on something if need be. But I'm excited, these will be good. I can either give them to guests when they come and visit or use them in the kitchen. Like I said, super exciting. Yay, washcloths. So that is it for finished objects. I do have two works in progress I'm going to show you guys. The first will be no surprise to anyone. It is my Whitmore sweater. This is a pattern by Amy Loudon, who also has the Little Tailoress podcast here on YouTube. She hasn't posted an episode in a really long time, like a year, I feel like. She released on Valentine's Day the Whitmore sweater. I have been drooling over this pattern since it was first released, not released, since she first teased it on Instagram back in December. I had offered to test knit it for her when she first put out a call for testers. Um, and she said, hey, you know, the holidays are coming up. Let's start the test in January. And then, um, my life at the time was a little too busy when she re-put it out and, you know, said, hey, if you asked, said you would test knit for me, just let me know. And I just didn't feel like I had the time to commit to it. So I was like, you know what, it's fine. I'll support, once again, a local business or not a local, an independent business, a woman-owned business, and I'll just purchase it. That being said, I did not anticipate the price of the pattern. So this is probably the most I've paid for a knitting pattern. It is $12. I'm not going to lie. That's a lot for a pattern. However, that being said, I think it's a really well written pattern. It is fully charted as well as fully written. So it's like a 20 or 30 page pattern at the end of the day. And I followed the charts. Uh, one of the people I was chatting with on Instagram the other day said they knew a few people who were having some issues with the clarity of the pattern. However, I myself have not run into those. So I'm not sure, maybe it's something in the written instructions. Um, so I did a gauge swatch while I was at the, well, two weekends ago, while I was in North Carolina, I told Zoe to cake up two of the yarns for me. And I was bringing two skeins of mohair with me. And I knew I was going to start it while I was there. So here is my Whitmore sweater. I started this, I believe I started, I cast on my swatch Thursday and I cast it on Friday and it features this really beautiful lace motif along the yoke. And I forgot to tell you guys what I'm knitting this out of. So I am knitting this out of Felicity Yarn Studio, which was my sister's hand dyed shop. I told you I got a little bag from Downtown Knits. 
So I am knitting this out of Zoe's Aquamarine colorway, which is my birthstone. And then um, some more Lang mohair, but this is their mohair Lux base. And this is a lot fluffier than the mohair I used in this sweater. Um, I will hold them up for comparison. This is regular Lang mohair. I don't know if you can tell a difference versus the Lux just has more of that fiber blended in. It's just a lot fluffier and it's really soft, like buttery soft. I am holding these two colors double and it's giving this really pretty effect. It kind of reminds me when the light catches it just right, the, the sweater itself kind of glows and it reminds me of pictures that you see of the underside of an iceberg, kind of that really cool, temperature cool feel. So I'm absolutely loving it. It's probably one of, it's my favorite knit to date this year. It'll probably be up there in one of my favorite garments. I knit, I knit the ribbing while we were at the Airbnb and got a couple charts done while we were yarn crawling. And then I went back to my parents' house, hung out with them for a day before my dad and I drove from North Carolina to Florida because I was taking some furniture uh, home that they were downsizing and, and rehoming. So one of the things I got is uh, my grandmother's old china cabinet. I believe it was also her mother's china cabinet and I absolutely love it. I have moved it into our guest room, which doubles as my craft room. Maybe this weekend I'll get a chance to do a little craft room tour for you guys because this space is finally starting to come together. Still need to hang some pictures and stuff up, so we'll, we shall see. The reason so much of this got done is because I had a 12-hour car ride from North Carolina to Florida. I was able to do most of the charts and then once I got home, I divided my sleeves. As I said, I am doing uh, emergency response shifts. So when we were not receiving truck orders or sending them out yesterday, I was knitting. So I got a fair amount done on the body in between deliveries and shipments. And yeah, that is my Whitmore sweater. Yay! Um, I'm. As you can tell, I'm, I'm loving this knit. I'm absolutely loving it. And last but not least, I can now finally talk about this in public. About a month ago, my brother texted me and Zoe and let us know that him and his wife are expecting. And so they are asking everyone, if you do give gifts, gender neutral. And so, I thought about knitting a blanket and I thought about knitting a garment and then I thought, no, I'm going to knit a stuffed animal. So I have started the Stegosaurus Junior pattern. I forgot to write down the designer's name, so I apologize. So I am knitting this out of leftover Felicity Yarn Studio from my Soldatna. Um, so this is the body of my Stegosaurus. It's a really quick knit. This in particular, I think it only took me like I don't know, two or three hours to knit the body. And then I just need to finish his feet and his spikes. So I have two feet done and then I need to knit the triangles. So I think I'm gonna do to make it a little more me. This feels very boy in color. I think I'm gonna add in um, some pink and peach spikes to go along the top. And yeah, I mean, even if it is a little girl, they can be into dinosaurs too. I've also found a pattern for a knit manatee stuffy. And so I'm gonna be knitting that as well. So yeah, that is it for works in progress. I have kind of just been crushing and cruising through my Whitmore and then, you know, finishing this bad boy. Really excited. My knitting's bringing me a lot of joy right now. So I know that was a lot, you guys. I appreciate it. If you've made it this far, I appreciate you sticking with me for the duration of this portion of the episode. I am going to try and record a little more this weekend and catch back up on getting some content pushed out. I have, 
I feel like I have been running a mile a minute since January. Like life has just been like boom, 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 boom. So I have to say the one nice unattended consequence of the coronavirus is I feel like everyone's getting a chance to take a break, breathe, slow down. Uh, my husband and I spent our day off on Sunday cleaning the house, um, doing some good spring cleaning and reorganizing rooms and all of that good stuff. So with being able to telecommute, you know, I feel like I can, when I take my 15 break, minute break, I can go do the dishes or I can go, you know, water the plants or plant some flowers or, you know, it's just giving a little bit of freedom back into our day. So I am trying to count my blessings with that and trying to find the positives and everything. So with that, you guys, thank you so much for watching. If you liked today's episode, hit that thumbs up button. If you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. I've been saying this for a few episodes now, but once we cross that 300 subscriber hurdle, I will be doing another giveaway to celebrate that milestone. So please consider subscribing. Thank you so much for watching you guys. Uh, Till next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay home, and keep your hands washed. Talk to you later. Bye.